external lecture from in the Transular India lab. And just a little bit of an introduction about him. Um, is a renowned Indian architect. He's an alumni from the Cambridge University in the UK, and he established his architectural firm in 1981. His practice is committed to principles of environmental sustainability and social responsibility, and he's engaged in architectural education since 1990. Over the last decade, he has conducted and supported research towards low carbon futures for urbanization in India. Um, Mr. Lal, the stage is yours. Well, thank you so much, Arti. Let me see if I can share my screen to start with. I, I have this strange feeling under my feet that I'm on a different planet at the moment. Um, and I'm not... <laughs> So I have to see. I, have I got something going there? Can you yes. see my screen? Uh, we see the PowerPoint. Yeah, now we see it. Yeah, you see. Well, that's all that you need to see. You don't need to see me at all. Uh, well, let me just, yeah, I have to oh, go to the beginning of this thing. Give me half a minute. Right. Um, so uh, I just want to share a few thoughts, um, and they say a little bit about some simple thoughts that have been evolving uh, through our practice over the years. I want to share those with you, talk about a, few, a couple of simple projects, and also raise some questions. I'd like to share some questions that I have with you all, for, for your, with your expertise, and hope that we can participate in responding to these questions as we go along. Um, it was in a long time ago, this is 2006, the president of India had said that his presidential estate should be net zero and would would the Ministry of Power find a solution? And so there was a project that was planned, which never actually happened, uh, which conceived a kind of a series of umbrellas which carried solar PV, which also provided shade under which the buildings would exist, uh, like two story or maybe three stories, and everything would be built out of the earth uh, that came out from the basements. So it was really quite a visionary thing at that time, and it was technically reasonably well worked out, except that the president had to move on. Uh, he was he did not continue his presidentship, and the project was given up. So that was a big vision. Uh, something that I have always felt very strongly about is that some some things just so common and so continue uh, continuing in our culture, like the idea of a handheld fan, it's it's really a, a perfect device, except that you have to use a hand to do it. Uh, it just shows you that, you know, blowing air over your face is the first thing to feel comfort. And this little device has spawned fantastic crafts, very beautiful. Uh, and this is a collection of some more than 100 fans from all over the country, which an artist has put together. And it's really organic adaptive design. It's a mind body tool continuum. There's no difference between the tool, yourself, your feeling, and the use of that tool. No difference. And there are some other expressions. Now, here's a pankha, as we call it, which is being pulled. This is pre-electricity. All of this is pre-electricity, which is pankha, which is pulled. And then you have a reverse fan on the right-hand side, which is a swing. Uh, you might have wondered, why are there swings inside buildings? Well, they have swings inside buildings because they're like a fan. Uh, and you just kick yourself with your feet, or you can pull a little string and get some comfort out of it. Very simple idea. And sharbats, <laughs> sharbats were invented in that part of the world, in the warm part of the world. Um, a whole range of drinks. Now, this is really looking after your body, something which is close to your body, working at the level of the body itself. What you see on the left-hand side is an earthen pot, ancient thing. Um, made of clay, so you put water in it, and during the warm seasons, the water evaporates from the outside and cools the water down. Um, nothing, you know, it's really great passive design. You get wet bulb temperature in the water. And the modern uh, market uh, uh, response is to add a tap to the same thing. But the basic principle is that of connecting the body that needs cooling down with evaporation of water. That's the basic principle over here. 
And then you let the body open itself to the cool air. Um, and if you're in the shade, it works perfectly well. So you can have high fashion, you can have middle fashion, you can have simple living. Uh, and this has been a way of life in many parts of the country. We are slowly losing it because we're becoming modern and we're going American. And really, I think we need to have a, a deep thought about our culture uh, of assumptions about the way we conduct ourselves as bodies, as persons, as culture, and then fall into all the traps of high energy consumption. Well, I hardly need to say anything about this, except that, yes, there are heat sinks and heat sources. Uh, there's a thing called vapor in the air, which is something that we need to pay attention to. And also the fact that the only variable that we have in, in our buildings at the moment are the windows. And you can add to that a ceiling fan or a ventilation fan. That's the only variable that we have. And I want to ask some questions about what more variables we could have in a simple way in the buildings. Going back in history, hot, dry desert. This is in Jaisalmer, very hot in the desert, very heavy building. Uh, and it's full of different kinds of spaces. You can go into the basement in the middle of the summer afternoon. You can go into the roof terrace to sleep under the night sky. You can be inside when it is raining and you can open the windows and let the breeze through. You can be in the courtyard. So here's a way in which the mind-body tool continuum is established and people just knew automatically how to use the buildings, its variable places and its variable elements. Um, and there's a connect between the fabric of the building and thermal comfort itself. And of course, this is district cooling. My gosh, we all know about this in Yazd, right? The wind just blows through and it picks up. It, it also pulls up cool air from the underground water channel. Uh, and you have heavy mass connected to the ground. And this is passive district cooling. I mean, you couldn't be more intelligent than this. Then there was a lot of work that was done about 20 years ago, 15 years ago on downdraft cooling towers. And here's an idea of a downdraft cooling tower that we did in a building in Gujarat. Um, so you have this umbrella, which actually also captures the rainwater and brings it down into a store. And then there is a shower in the middle of this column, which then sprinkles water atomizes it, and then the cool air then flows down and creates a uh, some added humidity and induces air movement in the space. And the air then escapes again from the ceiling because of the opening around the, uh, this is an entrance space. This is the main entrance space of the whole institution. And this is also a daylighting system um, and so on. Very effective, very simple. But here it is, it's adding humidity to the inside. We thought that we can extend this idea in this prototype for housing. Supposing you have two or three stories of housing. So between the houses, you have these annular spaces which have wind catchers. Behind the wind catchers, there's cooling system. There's just water dripping on pads. And then the wind pressure drives the air across the slabs through hollow slabs, as you can see here, hollow slabs, and then out at the opposite end. This way, now you're using wind pressure evaporative cooling combined with thermal mass, and that stores the cool inside the building. Ah, but it's a difficult thing to integrate. And we tested this, it was fairly successful. But I thought that, you know, it's not going to work at a large. This project that actually was to be a big housing project, we didn't go forward. But anyway, the, the prototype was a very instructive little thing. We then came, you know, up with our climate change and everybody's worried about temperatures rising and people wanted to be uh, more resilient and have better protection from the outside and so on. So here's high income homes in New Delhi with a composite climate and people are worried about rain, temperature rise, power systems, power outages and so on. So you have a house with a courtyard in the middle um, and the courtyard goes all the way up. It's a green courtyard with a pool at the bottom of the courtyard. OK. And so you'll have autonomy on water for a few days. You will have you will have power auto autonomy also if you connect the solar PV to the internal systems. At the moment, it's only a net 
uh, net metering system. You export all the power that you produce on the rooftop and you import the power from the main grid. That's the system at the moment. Um, so it's got a high performance envelope. Um, double glazing, insulated walls, a roof garden, and adjustable shading screens on the outside that you can pull over the over the glass according to the season, according to the time of day. You can do that. Um, and the pool of water at the bottom is cooled down just by a small fountain that's working constantly. And that cool water at what bulb, near wet bulb temperature is then circulated by a small pump through the slabs of the building. So that's the main so again, the connection between indirect evaporative cooling coupled with thermal mass as the system of taking away most of the heat. But in the humid season, this doesn't quite work, so you have to add a bit of air conditioning. So when we looked at the overall consumption of electricity through the year, the red bars tell you about the consumption of electricity, and the blue bars is the production of electricity from the solar PV, which is mounted on the roof. What we find is that in this particular place, the EPI for electricity consumption is 44 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, whereas the uh, uh, EP renewable energy uh, index is 42, roughly. And so you're near net zero. So what we're finding is that if you've got a four to five story high building and it's fairly efficiently designed, even with you know high level of comfort, which includes in this case, EV charging for the motor car, uh, you can get to near net zero, but that four or five story is a critical thing. So applying the same principle now to an office building, right? This is supposed to be net zero on site, air conditioned offices, five stories in Hyderabad, which is hot, dry climate. Here we have to agree with the clients that we're going to use the adaptive thermal comfort model, uh, which is meant for uh, mixed mode buildings, but we'll use it for the air conditioned building also. And we'll say that even if it is 28, 29 degrees centigrade inside with the ceiling fan running, you're going to be okay. So they sign on the dotted line. So we said that's one principle. First, think of your own adaptability, then think about what the building can do for you. And of course, making use of the very dry climate of Hyderabad, install a highly in, um, efficient cooling tower, which can bring, the, which has sort of one to two degree approach to wet bulb. You store that cool water in a big store in the basement, and then this water is then circulated through the slabs for radiant cooling. And there's a chiller which is added online, so to speak, to add a bit more cooling if required, and the chiller can also help you do the fresh air system uh, to provide the fresh air. So the radiant cooling actually takes care of the of the uh, the main loads from the uh, from from the internal gains, and then for getting rid of the um, latent loads, you have the fresh air system. Uh, this turned out to be actually very efficient. This building is now under construction. You have a solar PV array over the roof, which again shades the roof and shades the courtyard, um, and you have five stories. This is how the work the thing works internally. Uh, you have a Again, external shading screens, which can be moved. You have a roof terrace, which is well insulated. It's well insulated all around. And you have the radiant cooling system buried in the slab. And don't forget the ceiling fans. The ceiling fans are there. They can be operated by the occupants close to the fans. And of course, there are opening, openable windows for when it is you know, a late monsoon, when it's cooled down, or during the November, December season, when it's quite pleasant outside in any case. But we have a highly insulated envelope, all right, highly insulated envelope. What you find is the external loads are very little. It's internally internal load dominated. Now, the question is, we are now removing all the internal load through this radiant cooling system and a bit of a fresh air system. But the walls are totally inert, even the windows are well insulated. They are not doing any of the heat exchange that you could be using. So there's a question in my mind. Are we insulating too much or is there an in-between solution? But we did find that it's working out at 35 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum as the EPI. And again, because we are following the five story rule, the solar PV on the rooftop is now giving us more electricity than what is demanded on an annual basis by the building itself. We are net positive. But just remember this five story rule. So if you're talking about an urban system, 
which is five stories high, four stories high, with solar PV over the rooftops, uh, you can, with efficient building design, be a low carbon urban future for yourself. So what's been tending to happen is that with more and more insulation for air conditioned buildings, we are trying to move towards passive house kinds of way of doing things. And I think there's something fundamentally wrong. And this idea of 25 degrees centigrade as a universal standard, fundamentally wrong. I think we just have to give that up. And so that's one big question that I have. Um, how is it moving in your parts of the world to think of comfort as something which is a variable number, right? If you look at Delhi as, a, you know, there's some temperature charts, you have several seasons like you have in Europe, but here you have a pretty cold winter, then a very hot summer, then a humid season, then goes back into cold winter. And so actually, if you're talking about passive design, doing it all, almost all of it, we just need the building to have a variable response. And same thing in Chennai, which is a warm, humid climate. We again need the building to have a variable response. And here, um, despite the fact that, you know, people say this is warm, humid, this is tropical climate, there's not quite diurnal variation, but no, that's not the case. There are certain seasons when the diurnal variation is substantial. And when you look at the, the wet bulb temperatures in relation to dry bulb uh, temperatures, you still find that there is a cooling potential offered by the possibility of indirect evaporative cooling even in the humid climates, say in Chennai particularly. Now, let me just have a quick look at some little work that was done recently uh, on simulating for a low cost housing project. Uh, here we've got two dwelling units. One is facing north and it is in the middle floor and the other one is facing west and it's on the top floor, very exposed to the roof. Um, and we looked at many options of what you can do for passive cooling. An interesting finding was that if we insulated the walls of the building, it was turning out to be uh, more on discomfort hours with natural ventilation, right? With natural ventilation, you got more discomfort hours because you've insulated from the inside, right? But if you added a um, little bit of assisted ventilation, five, 15 air changes per hour, just did that much, suddenly it became much better. And then if you add um, external shading, roof insulation, uh, good control of window size, possibility of cross ventilation with assisted ventilation, et cetera, you'll find that no matter where you are in the, in the set of buildings, whether on the top floor facing east or west or north or south, right? The green bar here shows you the reduction in discomfort hours compared to the worst case, which is in the, to, in, the, in the tall blue sections. So passive building design can actually, if done intelligently, take you to a place where practically no air conditioning is required. Again, we are talking about being, people being comfortable at 28, 29 degrees centigrade. Last thing, this is the thing that I want to share with you. Um, we talk about, is there a possibility of having a variable thermal response in the building envelope itself? So here's a simple idea. Imagine a brick wall, or let's say a concrete wall, or a brick wall, which is about 10 centimeters. Then there's a wet pad outside, one of these cellulose pads outside that, which is attached to it across a vapor barrier. Uh, and outside that, there are shutters that can either close over the top of the wet pad, like, like here, this is a shutter that can be either closed or opened, all right? Or you can run water in this over the wetting pad, okay? So now by different kinds of operations, if it's closed, it's more like an insulating wall. If it's open, it's more conductive. If it is uh, cooled with water, then it extracts more heat from the outside. And whether it is day or night or um, uh, spring or summer or winter, this element begins to do different things according to the season. I just wanted to know whether this is a, an interesting approach and whether we can investigate this further. Well, just to conclude very quickly, what I believe and what we believe here is that low carbon design for thermal comfort must utilize and strengthen our body adaptive capacities. That's the purpose of design. 
not to think is the body demanding only something, you know, very, very tight in terms of temperature variation. It can do, it can accept a lot. And of course, you can also, um, in your own ways, whether it is through food or the fans or clothing, you can do a lot of adaptation. And air movement is an integral part. Air movement will always be an integral part for cooling. And we must accept mixed mode adaptive thermal comfort standards, even for air conditioned buildings. And certainly the potential of evaporative cooling coupled with thermal mass using recycled water might be a good way to go forward. And I'm just throwing a few numbers. We are saying, say for residential buildings in India, we cap the EPI at 35 and we cap the EPI at 50 for commercial buildings. Um, and then if we add that five story rule, I think we might be getting close to net zero. A question still remains in my mind. If you're talking about the external envelope, I still don't know how to, I mean, we've done some modeling and all that, but I still haven't got a really good hang of it. There's a relationship between the thermal mass of the external envelope and the insulating capacity of the external envelope and how you modulate it for different seasons or for different climatic conditions. So here we are. In 2030, there is a possibility of going towards a net zero tropical urbanism. Thank you.